if you all are, here we go. Eight. Welcome to the smartest people in the room. We are so glad you were here with us. And just by showing up, you are already demonstrating your very own smarts. Today, I am pleased to feature two rock star music executives who, among many accolades, have dedicated their careers to helping improve the music industry opportunities for copyright holders and songwriters in particular. I promise you will leave today smarter and more inspired than you arrived. Before we get started, please let me take care of some business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we want to showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Many of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. I run the music practice at Turnkey ZRG, and I place music executives in roles throughout the industry. So by definition and function, I help people connect with companies. In this series, my goal is to help you make more connections, and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, share your LinkedIn profile, say hello to your friends and make some new ones and ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as, as we can along the way. And please make sure that your chat is set to address everyone, not just the speakers. I wanna thank our program sponsors for without their support, we couldn't continue to keep this free. Thank you to First Horizon Bank, Turnkey ZRG, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Tennessee Brew Works, Project Music, and Cushmaster's brand of CBD products. I also want to introduce a brand new sponsor to our lineup called MedJet. MedJet is the top rated medical transport and travel security program for people who travel extensively. It provides insurance coverage that gets you to the nearest hospital if needed and gets you home. MedJet is travel protection elevated. But let's get down to business. In today's host seat, we welcome Rick Krim. Rick started his career in the music business in 1982 at MTV as business manager and eventually rose to VP of talent and artist relations, where he served as the liaison between MTV and artists, managers, and record companies. He left MTV in 1994 to become SVP of talent acquisition and marketing at EMI Music Publishing. There, he was responsible for overseeing the promotion and marketing department while also signing new artists and songwriters. His signings at EMI included Train, Goo Goo Dolls, and Good Charlotte, among many others. After a six-year stint at EMI, Rick returned to Viacom as EVP of Talent and Programming for VH1. This gave him responsibility for all talent and re label relations for VH1 and its portfolio of channels. And he also oversaw all music programming as well as the development of music-based shows. He was the executive producer of iconic programming franchises such as Storytellers, Divas, and Hip Hop Honors, and also won an Emmy for his work on the documentary Anvil, The Story of Anvil. Rick joined Republic Records in 2014 in the newly created position of EVP of Artist Development, but his tenure there was interrupted by the opportunity to go back into music publishing, and he joined Sony ATV Music Publishing in early 2015 as co-president of the U.S., where he led the company's A&R operations in L.A., reunited him with legendary music publishing executive Martin Bandier, whom he worked for at EMI. Upon leaving Sony in 2019, Rick started his own company, Crim Music and Media, and has been working in a variety of areas, including documentaries, live events, artist management, music publishing, and more. In addition, he is partner in the Black Squirrel, the family offices, activities of Metallica, and those close to the band looking for opportunities in music and technology. Welcome, Rick. So glad to have you here. Happy to be here, Tom. Thank you. And joining Rick as today's special guest is Jeff Price. Jeff is one of the music industry's most successful and disruptive innovators. He has built and sold several companies in different areas of the music industry. He's currently the founder and CEO of Word Collections. Word Collections is a global copyright administration company for publishers, songwriters, authors, and spoken word comedians. Its lead investors include many A-listers in the music industry, which I will not name here. In 2013, Jeff launched Audium. Audium is a digital rights reproduction collection agency for publishers and songwriters. Audium was bought by SoCan in 2016 and recently sold to CSAC slash Harry Fox and Associates. 
In 2006, Jeff launched TuneCore, thus changing the global music industry by commoditizing and democratizing it for indie artists. He was CEO of TuneCore for seven years. TuneCore itself was also acquired by Believe Digital in 2015. In 1990, Jeff co-founded and was GM and president of the New York-based independent record label Spin Art Records and spent 17 years there. Along the way, Jeff has done work tirelessly on behalf of copyright holders in a few other ways. For instance, he identified Spotify's infringement of copyright and put together the class and multiple direct action lawsuits against Spotify. He was asked by the MMA co-sponsor Hakeem Jeffries to mark up the bill and provide information to Senator Dianne Feinstein's legislative aid. He was also one of the 14 board members of the AMLC, an entity that submitted itself for designation as the MLC under the Music Modernization Act. In 2019, he testified to the Canadian House of Commons Standing Committee on Industry, Science, Technology, in view of its forthcoming study called the Statutory Review of Copyright Act. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to welcome Rick and Jeff to the smartest people in the room. Please take it away, Rick. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure to be here. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how I finagled you to do this. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm thrilled. I, you know, as I said before, I consider myself more the, should be on the luckiest people in the room, having uh, you know, been able to do this for so long. Tom unfortunately had to date me by saying I started in 1982, but I was I was 12 when I started at MTV. So, um, but Jeff, yeah, what I think is uh, fun about our relationship is we just recently connected, reconnected a year ago after probably not having spoken since maybe for no other reason than our past in crust since probably 1994. Yeah, when I was at MTV and you were at uh, you were at Spin Art and you were. You know, I was happy if you answered the phone when I called. <laughs> you're working, you're working on getting your videos played, but um, I'm listen. I'm, I'm always interested and fascinated because people ask me this all the time. You know, how did you get in the music business? And I don't know if I've ever uh, really asked you that. That how did uh, how did that all come about? How did Spin Art, which was a very cool, very cool label. I was the indie label guy at MTV, so you were you you actually were high on my list. You know, I didn't get to deal with the big boys yet, so. Yeah, well, we never had a hit. Um, Box above our wave and never had a hit. By the way, you got the black t-shirt memo, so that's good, right? And the other thing, I want MedJet. I don't know anything about that company that's one of your sponsors, Tom, but I want a jet sitting there <laughs> waiting to fly me somewhere in the event I have a medical emergency. That would be effing awesome. All right, I just want to say that because that sounded cool. Um, you know, I'm fascinated, Rick, too, man. How the hell did you end up at the you know, head of talent at VH1 MTV? That's insane. Um, and I wasn't kidding. I, I still, after hearing your background, I, how the hell did I get you to do this with me? So um, that being said, I, I graduated, you know, college with a degree in sociology, which is perfect for waiting tables. And uh, that is exactly what I did while starting my own business, uh, selling personalized children's books out of a kiosk. It was my own little franchise thing. And my high school friend, Joel, uh, wanted to release in 1990 a CD of these indie rock bands that we were really into from the DC area. I went to, I went to eight schools over my 12 years and ended up 10th, 11th, 12th grade in Washington, DC, which was a burgeoning scene for indie rock, punk, et cetera. And we um, walked around to Velocity Girl and Suddenly Tammy and, oh God, a Small Factory and uh, Lois Mafio and, uh, and I just got to go through the list and ultimately asked them, can we release you on a CD? Remember, 1990, 1989, 1990, CDs were still, you know, they weren't the dominant format. They were still up and coming and everyone was rebuying their stuff from vinyl to CD. So a lot of this music still had never come out on a CD. And we... Um, Joel said yes, and I quit my day job that I didn't have. I was actually a, uh, a, an intern on a film called No Telling, which is being shot in Woodstock, New York, with Rachel Horowitz as the executive, was the producer. She went on to produce Moneyball, amongst other things, and her brother is Adam Horowitz, who's King Ad-Rock in the Beastie Boys, who I'm related to through my father's wife of 40 years. So Israel and, and Adam, they're like relatives. Um, I remember when Adam was in the Young and the Useless, his punk band before the Beastie Boys, and came in with that vinyl seven inch single of My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. And I, th I think I still actually have it. Anyway, way off topic. So um, 
I asked Joel if I could help him release the CD, and that's how Spin Art Records was born. Um, I began running the label out of my apartment in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which where I was living after college, Franklin and Marshall, just because I ended up there. And Joel was interning at IRS and SBK Records and was a little worried that it might feel like a conflict of interest if he was seen as running a label. So I was kind of the face. And just personality wise, Joel was more talent to A&R and creative and I was more business. It's kind of the way we segregated. But we released the CD called One Last Kiss which became this sort of iconic CD with 19 artists on it. And it was a complete and utter fluke. We, um, we made a little booklet. We wanted to include what's called a fanzine, which is basically a photocopy, you know, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper folded up with information about each artist, which would be in the CD. And we manufactured these CDs and all of our money. It was like sitting there in these CDs and the jewel boxes and trays sitting in our living room. Not that we knew how to distribute anything, but just figure it would all magically work. And the bands hadn't gotten us all their information in regard to the, the fanzine. So we've manufactured the CDs, inserted them together to save a nickel per unit on the insertion fees, right? And started calling up places. And I think I mailed like four or five copies out. I sent one copy to Spin Magazine, one to the Washington Post, uh, Alternative Press, which was around then. And that was about it. And lo and behold, we ended up with a full page, like the entire page in the arts and leisure section of the Washington Post on the CD. And then Spin Magazine came out with this full page on it. And all of a sudden, it became the flavor of the month. And I began receiving inbound phone calls from AR people at major record labels. Now, remember, this is around the time where Nirvana hit. Right. And so for the first time, we had alternative and, and non mainstream rock and indie rock bands crossing over into top 40, which was bizarre. Right. Top 40 was boys to men. It wasn't Nirvana. So this weird thing happened. And the majors now were looking at indie labels as these feeder A&R sources to provide them the next Nirvana. Right. So all of a sudden we got these inbound phone calls from major labels asking for copies of the CD and. I would say, well, sure, it's available for $10. And they're like, no, uh, you don't you understand? I'm Billy Bag of Donuts with blah, blah, a and And I'm like, great, then you can afford the $10. So it kind of gave, gave us a little bit of attitude, which somehow ended added to the mystique. And then the next thing you know, uh, we ended up through a weird circus variety of events, which included this artist, Suddenly Tammy, opening for the London Suede on the first North American tour, which came because an attorney dropped dead in a CVS and moved to another law firm. And, and Gary Badley was friends with someone from ICM Fair Warning. And my brother ended up in London and I just happened to drop off this. Anyway, wait, it's, you know, do sex machina. And um, I ended up in this meeting with a woman named Mary Gormley, who was an a and person. I believe at the time she was at Geffen and she had signed Jack Hall, amongst others. And Mary moved over to Columbia David Kahn was the VP, I think, of Columbia Records. I believe, uh, I don't think John, John Ingrassia became the president later on. Anyway, we just ended up in a label deal with Columbia Records because many of these artists on One Last Kiss and then the subsequent releases we did, Suddenly Tammy, uh, Lilies, uh, gosh, Monsterland, Dam Builders, Small Factory, they all kept getting picked up by these indie labels or imprints, excuse me, major labels or imprints of the majors. So we ended up in a label deal with Sony, with uh, you know Don Einer, Michelle Anthony, David Kahn, Jim Dunbar, Mary Gormley, and they thought it was kind of fun that we were running the record label out of my bedroom on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I was on the third floor of a three-story walk-up. I had two other roommates, both women, so it was like three's company, and the record label was in the bedroom. And so after we did this label deal, Columbia Records insisted that we get an office <laughs> because they didn't like calling into my bedroom where we had call waiting, right? And that was also the fax machine. And ultimately we ended up getting an office at 580 Broadway, the quarter of Houston and Prince Street in, uh, in downtown Manhattan, which now real estate is through the roof. But that's sort of the background. And the deal with Columbia Records was you at Spin Art, you and Joel can go release whoever you want. And they gave us a budget each time we signed an artist. I think if our memory serves, it was like around, we had $10,000. And that was to record the album, manufacture the first 4,000 units and do everything else. And we're like, yeah, great. 
So we just started releasing music we loved for the next two years. The idea of making money, and this is going to sound nuts, didn't occur to us. It was just, let's just release these artists that we love. And it was a trial by fire. Uh, everything that I know, I learned by doing. Right? What was your biggest success at Spin Art? Like, what, what? I, think, I think the Apples and Stereo were the best-selling, highest-profile artist that we had released. Uh, we never, never had commercial success. You know, we released Richard Thompson, Frank Black and the Catholics, Pixies album, uh, did some Eels vinyl, but Clem Snide, Apples and Stereo, blah, blah, blah. But I don't think anyone sold over 40,000 copies of anything. Uh, but we always boxed above our weight. And today, uh, today that would be platinum, I think. <laughs> it'd be double, double diamond, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was weird because we never had this commercial success, but we always had this perception that we were more than we were. And we got dropped by Sony after two years, right? And um, then we ended up in a label deal with Giant Records and Irving Azoff. And then that had a, some fun twists and turns. And then we ended up in a deal with Seymour Stein at Sire. All the legends. All the legends you were associated with. As I stand in their shadows. Yeah. I mean, if I had this much of the success of them, uh, it would have been great. But on the other hand, I wouldn't have gone down this trajectory, this path. So anyone that's upset with who I am and what I do, you can blame Seymour Stein, Irving Azoff, and and uh, and Donnie Einer. And did we play did, did, did we play any of your videos? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? Empty. So 120 minutes, you guys programmed from time to time. Uh, we did get airplay and you were more accessible. You know, it got very frustrating in the um, like 1994 or so commercial radio stopped taking the phone calls unless they were coming in from the indie promoters, which is very frustrating. But uh, MTV in particular always did respond or interact and, and would provide play. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, so, we, yeah. we, we, we like the labels better than the indie promoters. There were there were a few indies in the uh, video world, but slightly different, uh, they had a different ethics code than the uh, indies in the other world. So they were a little more straightforward. It, it was a, it, it was really frustrating. You know, I agree with you, but it drove me crazy because, you know, my job is to work on behalf of the people that have allowed me to market, promote, distribute. And it's frustrating when someone won't even take your phone call simply because your parent company isn't Warner or whatever it might be. And, you know, you have to fight and beg and borrow and steal and push and get creative. Anything you can do, anything you can think of in order to punch your way through just, just to get heard. And you think of all the gatekeeping, right? First, we have the A&R people, like the labels of which I was one, where we would editorially decide what had value. You know, okay, we decide you, one band out of the teeming masses of tens of millions, you're the one that has value because we said so. And then we have to go to the gatekeepers at the retail stores, the buyers, right? If you can't get your, your music on the shelves, it can't get bought. So they editorially decide what goes there. And then you gotta go and you gotta get through the gatekeepers at the print magazines, right? Spin, Rolling Stone, Alternative Press, Option, Magnet. And you have to fight your way through there. And then you gotta go fight your way through radio, college radio, AAA, alternative. And then you gotta go fight your way through MTV. So there's just these layers and layers of, of gatekeepers that, that you have to- It is follow. fun being a gatekeeper, by the way. It is I'll a, bet it is, man. Well, here, let me give you the reason why. Look, look at, everyone look at Rick's wall, okay? Look what's behind him. Now look what's behind my wall, ready? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you get, but it is, must be fun to be a gatekeeper. So it was always my job to find the way through and just beg, borrow, steal, limp, max out the credit cards, do whatever you could uh, to get your band the opportunity to get heard because you believed in them. But anyway, that's that's kind of the story until 2005 when we basically went out of business. Well, I had a fine appreciation for the indie world because when I, my early days at MTV, because I came from, I, as Tom mentioned, I started as business manager. You know, I was a, uh, I worked at Price Waterhouse in Philadelphia as a, no first, as a first year staff auditor, which is about as low as you can possibly go on the totem pole. Yeah, I was... I didn't, you know, I love music. I wanted to work in the music business, but I was also good with numbers and I didn't know anybody in the music business, um, which certainly helped. So I took the, you know, I took the job. I also went to school in Pennsylvania and took a job out of college at, at Pricewaterhouse in Philadelphia. Well, what was your major? 
I was an accounting major and a music minor. I actually didn't pass my CPA exam. I only passed three fourths of the CPA exam because I spent all my time my senior year working on my music theory final of uh, this piece I wrote. And I just, that was the OCD in me took over and I had to, it had to be perfect. So I neglected to study as much as I should have for the CPA and instead cool. said, got it, but I got an A on my music theory final. So but no, no, I, I want to know what was the music, like, what was the piece you wrote? What was it? I actually, I'll send it to you. I actually still, I found it recently. Really? And then I got, and then I got all the guys in the, I went to Bucknell and I got all the guys in the Bucknell jazz band to actually perform on it for, I didn't perform. I actually wrote it. I was the composer and then they performed oh, cool. on it. I, I, so you can literally like write sheet music. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't know if I could anymore. I did back then. Wow. So, and then I got, you know, I refer to myself as the luckiest person because I got a lucky break and ran into somebody at a wedding who was not even invited to crash the wedding and, and uh, from my hometown, a woman named Joan Myers. And she was working at the time at this new thing called MTV, uh, which was about nine months old. Uh, I lived in South Jersey. We had we were one of the first cable systems to have it, so I was obsessed with it like everybody else. And I said, "Well, how do I get a job there?" And she goes, uh, "I think we're looking. I think we're. I think my boss is looking for a budget guy." She didn't know, and she. I said, "Can you get me an interview?" And she did, and and I got went up to New York, and she introduced me to her boss, this this legend named Les Garland, um, who was one of the. Uh, one of the early, early, early heads of MTV. He was the head of programming and, you know, got a meeting with him and sat in a room, talked to him and literally said, Bud Meyer says, you're cool. Let's do this. Um, and so, uh, what, what I, I, got hired, I got hired at 22 as the business manager of MTV. <laughs> so what did that mean as the business manager of MTV? I, that meant I had to, uh, I was the liaison. It, it, Technically, it meant I was the liaison between the programming people and corporate as far as budgets, tracking expenses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, in practice, I was just, you know, making sure like I could figure out how to bear the expense reports of all the crazy nights every day. <laughs> <laughs> as, as I used to joke, Les Garland, he was going to Barney, he was, he was going to Barney's for before there was a restaurant. He was putting in expenses at Barney's before there was a restaurant there. That's funny. So, um, it's because he had the but time. There, but, but there were only there were only a hundred people that worked there, and it was uh, you know it would never happen today. But as the business manager, I got to stick my nose in the music meetings and so forth, and then convince them after a few years of doing that that I was ready for the next move. And uh, John Sykes actually it was the, well, also one of the founders moved me over from that area to the music talent area because and then I was I was put in charge of the indie labels I was the indie labels liaison and indie labels weren't what this is 1985 and indie labels weren't in 1985 what they are today how hard was it convincing the record labels to pretend to to begin to produce the music video content at their own expense for you to program um you know they, they Interestingly, the UK labels were really the, at the forefront of that. They were doing that even even before MTV start really got going. It was the UK labels were much more receptive to it, mm -hmm. um, and I think it was once they saw some success and saw the power of MTV, and especially in the early '80s, that stuff that wasn't getting played on the radio that MTV was playing, and you know the real heyday started happening '82, '83 with Duran Duran and. Uh, Stray Cats and Cindy Lauper and uh, Billy Idol and and all these things that started happening that MTV was really the catalyst for. So, but yeah, the you know that is a age old argument that, that well that some people felt oh well what a brilliant move we we you get someone else to pay for all your programming, but the reality you know when MTV was at its height it. It sold records. It was a catalyst. Uh, yeah. No I, argument. I mean, literally like, overnight, literally overnight, bands would break. The reason I, you know, we could play a video once or twice, and you know, next thing you know, I have a gold record. No, it's fascinating too. That that's the Facebook model, right? It's UGC content. It's not they're not producing the content. Same thing with YouTube. But there is a one to one correlation, and I will attest to it between airplay on MTV and and music sales. You could just like NPR, right? You get onto uh, all things considered or fresh air or something, and you can see this correlation. 
and it was the same with MTV. That's fascinating. So it must have been interesting at the major labels in the A and R and the marketing meetings to discuss. We got to do these music videos. What's the budget around it? And do we have and the horse? And indie labels weren't making high. You know, they didn't have the budgets that the oh. the first two videos I actually got played on MTV were. Um, they might be giants. Put your hand inside the puppet head, That's which cool. was on Bar None, and um, the Smithereens Blood and Roses, which was really? on uh, Enigma. That's really <clears throat> Those are my two first two. Uh, successes before I graduated to the major labels. So that. how did you migrate from finance into, into talent and coordination? Just persistence <laughs> and just convince, you know, I, listen, I'm a music junkie. I'm a music fan. I like, you know, I feel like, felt like I knew a lot about music and was very passionate about it. And I was still young enough to want to work 24 hours a day to, you know, I, what during the off hours, even when I was in the business side, I'd go into like the dub rooms and make make reels of all of my favorite videos on to, you know, take them from the three quarter inch tapes and make a VHS reel of all my favorite videos that I'd go home and watch. That's cool. Um, so yeah, I, listen, again, I think because there were a hundred people there and I got, you know, I was had they able, they, they, they allowed me into their world um, even when I was the business manager. I think probably because I was bearing their expense reports really well for them and they, you know, um, but uh, listen, it was an exciting time, and uh, and you have people like uh, me calling you up, begging you to play something. No, listen, it, it was great. The time, I, the years I was there was the you know in my mind the heyday of the, the first heyday of MTV, and I you know talk about it now. I feel like I should be on a rocking chair on the front porch telling the kids about back in the old days when uh, this channel played music videos all day long, and you couldn't get them anywhere else. But it was. It was an amazing time. It was, it was you know, I'll tell you, it's absolutely fascinating. And I think about it, and this is the way I think about it, which is in the history of the music industry, which is, you know, as long as the dawn of man, there's this one short little time period in there, right? It's probably from, you know, after the Beatles, where you have bands become mega superstars and then MTV comes up. And the MTV commercial radio time from like the early mid 80s through around like the getting into the 2000s. That was a very unique period of time with, with, you know, the consolidation hadn't all happened yet. There was still independent radio, it was MTV, and you had these freaking rock superstars in a way, I'm not sure you can ever have again with catalog, right? And, and band development. And it, it's this unique snapshot of time, which right now to me is the lifeblood of the industry. Not that there isn't new talent that's not important, but catalog is the lifeblood of the music industry. Right. It's you don't you've it just keeps selling and generating revenue for both the artists and the labels and the music publishers, and it allows you to feed the machine. So it's it's very interesting to me because it's not like we're gonna have another birds box set coming out, you know. Right. Anyway. So the, yeah, anyway, thank, thank I didn't know I didn't know the right sheet music. I think that's really cool. I can't well, play. I wouldn't don't get carried away with that. It was like <laughs> it's it's that's that's hard. Man, I yes. have very lots of respect for people who uh who do that, who, who, who do that for a living, especially, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not a classical music expert, but actually a good friend of mine from my MTV years, I was, I was a big, uh, so the late eighties, early nineties, the, uh, you know, the, the hard rock hair metal years were a particularly fun time for me and got to know a lot of those folks and was smack in the middle of all that. And, um, one of those artists, uh, Kip Winger, who was, um, you know, Winger was a very successful band from that era that in my mind, and I waved the Winger flag loud and proud because they were crazy talented musicians, got somehow, he became the poster boy in a lot of ways for it, you know, kind of, but mostly because the, the, the nerdy kid on Beavis and Butthead, Stuart was wearing, a, well, while Beavis and Butthead were wearing Metallica and ACDC t-shirts, the, the nerdy kid wore a Winger t-shirt. <clears throat> and, that, and that definitely, uh, you know, that definitely, altered their career path in a negative way but shift to last week he premiered a symphony at the nashville oh, no. he, he had he, he got nominated for a grammy for classical music a couple years ago and last week his symph his first symphony premiered in nashville i can't do that so no, my, lots of lots of you know my, my big brush respect for that my, so my um brush with fame you know i was i was working at the hard rock cafe in new york city back in the old days when there was like two, one in West. And anyway, and, and Lou Reed was having a party in the Feelies were the opening band. 
And I got to bust Lou Reed in the Feelys table. And I was so excited. <laughs> I got to take their sloppy ketchup and napkin from them. And I was, I was very excited. And one other quick way, here's the other anecdotal one. I was sitting in a deli on uh, with my friends freshman year of college and you two were playing in Madison Square Garden that night. And at the, the booth across me, there was Bono. And, you know, and he was, he was drawing something out on a napkin and he left and he ended, they ended up stiffing the deli on the check. And the waitress was like, where is this guy? I'm like, well, we'll be at Madison Square Garden tonight. But my friend Ted stole the napkin and it was a stage plan that Bono wrote out with, you know, it said sea of parters on it. And we still have, he still has this napkin in this like hermetically sealed Ziploc bag. All right. There's my brush with fame stories. Amazing. So wait, so did you, did, did TuneCore come after SpinArt? Or was there something? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. So, so uh, TuneCore was necessity being the mother of invention. Um, you know, the, the record label, there were four of us. It was myself and Joel and usually two other, you know, full-time people. And we began going out of business. I mean, we tried and tried. And as you get into 2005, we, we were done. It was, it was brutal. It was horrible. There were bands that didn't get paid the royalties we were supposed to pay them. Um, my student loans went into default. There was no health care. The savings I had, I put everything I had into it. And we just, we couldn't survive. We just weren't selling. Uh, and I had to, you know, lay off one of my staff. Um, it was brutal. You know, it, it seems weird. Even now, it still brings up an emotional response. And I, I vowed I'm never, ever going to let that happen again. Ever. That's not, I'm, I, I can't live with myself was number one. And number two, I was thinking, how can I stay in the music industry and have it not be predicated on if music sold? Because if I can figure that out, Great, right? I realized the CD manufacturing and vinyl plants, they were getting paid regardless of if the vinyl or CD sold. The post office was getting the postage money. Kinko's was getting the photocopy money. The Jiffy Pack people, because they were still mailing CDs out there. How could I get on that side of the fence? So that was one thing that was kicking around in my head. And the other thing that was troubling me is new music distributors had come into existence because of digital. Right. And so there was this massive market, there was this massive paradigm shift. The physical world, right? You have a pick, pack, and ship warehouse, you know, 100 foot high ceilings, little carts running around, filling in boxes, putting them on wooden pallets, shipping them out. Everything is on consignment at retail stores, can be returned at any time for a full refund. You had to buy your way onto the shelf of the store through cooperative advertising, paying like $2 a CD just to get the damn thing on the shelf, take the buyers out to dinner, blah, blah, blah. Up comes digital, right? So in 1996, I called this guy, Ken Goes, who was the manager at that time for Throwing Muses and the Pixies. And the reason I called him is we released this artist on spin art called Lotion, who I still adore to this day. I mean, I've just, I've rediscovered all their albums again, even though I never lost them. And the way I think about the world is typically you always start at a no. Right. And what harm could there be in calling somebody? Because the worst thing that happens is you end up where you started. So I always just call. I don't care if it's a senator or a congressman or, or the president or CEO of a corporation or the manager for the Pixies. Why not? And I was trying to convince him to have the artist Lotion open for Frank Black, the lead singer of the Pixies, Charles Thompson, uh, on a forthcoming tour. And while I was on the phone with Ken, he put me on hold and he came back and he said, well, that deal fell through. And I said, what deal? He said, well, we are no longer on Rick Rubin's Deaf American. We're free. And we have an album, Frank Black and the Catholics. And we had a deal with Stone Gossip from Pearl Jam through his record label. Uh, but we have done a deal with this company called Good Noise for our digital rights. Now, this was 1994, 1995. And they won't do a deal with us because we've splintered off the digital rights. And I didn't even know what that meant. I was like, I'll do a deal with you. So that's how I ended up signing Frank Black. I just, you know, life is timing, Rick, right? It's luck. And, but you make your luck. And um, the relevance of that is I got introduced to Gene Hoffman and Bob Cohn. So Gene Hoffman at the time is, was 20 and became the youngest CEO of a NASDAQ listed corporation. And Bob Cohn and his dad wrote Cohn on Music Licensing, this tome of a book all about music licensing. And they were the founders of a company called Good Noise, which became eMusic, which was the first online digital music service. And ultimately I ended up, they had the rights to Frank Black for digital. I had them for physical. 
And we just began working together. Ultimately, I became like employee number, I don't know, five, six or something at, at Good Noise, which became eMusic and helped them raise $120 million in you know, these multiple rounds and learned what a stock option was. And it's kind of where I got my chops in the digital. But that's the really important point is I got my chops in digital there, kind of at its inception about downloads from Bob Cohn about mechanical royalties and how does all this work, right? So move forward in time, 2005, spin arts going out of business in a ball of flames. I'm trying to think how to get to the other side of the fence so I can make money without it being predicated on music sales. And I'm very frustrated because I've seen new entities pop up, right? Go back to 2005, an organization like The Orchard was charging a 30% distribution fee, right? Now, in order to distribute, because you could be a distributor now just with internet access and a contract, you didn't need to have that warehouse. You didn't need to have the income tracking and the, the finance department. And it really frustrated me. I just thought it was wrong. You know, why should you take a 30% distribution fee because you're a gatekeeper because you happen to have the contract with iTunes, right? You're, you're moving a digital file from point A to point B, and that's kind of it. There's no co-ops. You're not taking the store owner out to dinner. You're not, you know, buying the radio station guy a new washing machine to get Wilson Phillips in Florida played, whatever it might be. So um, I, I was having this visceral reaction, like that's just wrong. You know, and those two concepts, I remember I was taking a shower. I remember the apartment, the time, everything. I said, you know what? I have this contract with iTunes. I have these contracts with Rhapsody because Spin Art Records had done a deal with Ryko distribution for the physical, but we had maintained our own digital rights because frankly, I knew more about it than they did because of the e-music experience. And I thought, you know what? Why don't I just start distributing people's music and not make any judgment if it's good or bad, let them all in. And then I thought, you know what? Why don't I just charge a flat fee for the service? They get all the money when the music sells and they can cancel with us, with us whenever they want. Keep, keep your copyrights, get all the money. I'm FedEx, you pay a simple flat fee. And that was the idea for TuneCore. And I called up my friends, Gary and Peter. Now they were living in North Attleboro, Massachusetts. Gary uh, is a programmer and he was working as a programming engineer for CVS pharmacies. Peter was a savant with a piano, can hear anything once and instantly play it. And Peter was selling pianos at a Steinway store. And I said, here's my idea. What do you think? And they said, we're in. Peter's father had just passed away and he had inherited $40,000. Just the timing again was, was just bizarre. And so this was October of 2005. And I was like, let's get live next week. And I went through sort of a learning curve on technology and programming. And, and but so basically we came up with the idea in October, we went live in January of 2006. And that's when TuneCore was born as a, I need a career and I'm pissed off with what I think was an exploitive business model. And it was interesting. I'm not crazy about the name TuneCore, just everything else was taken at that time. Um, but it was cool because when you type TuneCore into Google at that time, literally got no results. And a week after we launched, there were over 200,000 now index pages that came back. And the timing, the RIAA at that point was trying to deal with the, the fallout of Napster. And literally, you know, we're pursuing a, a new strategy of, okay, let's go after the consumers. We're literally going to sue grandma. You know, I'm not gonna offer an opinion for better or for worse, but you had a backlash against the RIAA and the traditional labels. Then you had this new company, TuneCore, that came in, which was sort of democratizing it. And we just kind of got swept up in this zeitgeist and the company just, just took off. And from there, it became a learning curve of how to build a company and build technology uh, through pure serendipity, man. Like I said, I just picked up the phone and I started calling people. I called Guitar Center because I figured they had all my clients, right? And uh, Already too long a story short, I ended up on the phone with 15 people from Guitar Center one day, pitching my little heart out. And someone on the call says, hey, I'm going to be in New York next week. Can we meet while I'm there? And I was like, sure. I, I didn't even know who it was. It turned out it was their CEO, a guy named Marty Albertson. Now, at this point, Guitar Center was publicly traded with a market cap of about $65 billion. And I go to meet the CEO of Guitar Center to dog and pony to show them what And at the time I was like, okay, I need to raise money to scale the company up. And I thought I need a half a million dollars. 
You know, I made a little budget, which is a lot of money. That's a lot of money in some ways. And to others, it's not. But to me, it's a lot of money. And hand to heart, I go into this meeting. We're in sort of a basement office of Guitar Center with um, Ernie Ball guitar strings. So the Ball family was there because they're friends with Marty. And the manager's there. And I'm praying to God the website doesn't crash. (laughs) And Marty asked everyone to leave the room. And he says, okay, what are you looking for? I said, I'm looking to raise a half a million dollars. He says, I'm in for two million. Tell me what I get. Hand to heart. I was like, uh, okay. And I left and I called my, my advisor, financial advisor, a friend of mine named John Catterin, who's in the John Kate band and is a CPA, but also an auditor for Cooper's and Lime Brand. And I worked with him at eMusic, but he also is an active touring band and you should all listen to his music. Anyway, and so we put together a deal and that was the a round of investment capital that came from Guitar Center. And with that, I was able to begin to hire more and scale up. But the real sort of intense education began with what we call the B round. So every time you raise money, it gets a new letter of the alphabet, right? The first money is the A round. The second money is the B round and so forth and so on. We ended up uh, getting an inbound phone call from a traditional Silicon Valley based venture capitalist called the Opus Capital guy named Gil Kogan. And they ended up saying, we want to invest in word collection. Excuse me, TuneCore, <laughs> sorry, in TuneCore. And there was another sort of pivotal moment. I remember this because remember, Guitar Center owned a significant portion of TuneCore at the time. And I believe Gil flew his private jet into the, you know, the local airport by Guitar Center. And we were meeting in, in Guitar Center's office. And I'm watching these two titans of industry, right? Gil Kogan was at Lightspeed Capital. I think they had a $15 billion fund. Uh, Opus was his small fund of only a billion dollars. And I'm watching these two guys talking about the company that I founded, right? And Gil says to me, you need, what do you, you know, I'm trying to raise $3 million. He's like, that's not enough money. Okay. He's like, yeah, you need to raise closer to $10 million. I mean, they're just spitting these numbers out. And I'm like, Okay. He's like, yeah, because you need to scale up. This is what you're going to need. All right. Um, and I said, but how are we going to do that? Because if the, you know, let's say the value of the company is 10 million and you're putting in 10 million, but Guitar Center already owns a certain percent. There's no room. He's like, oh, that's easy. I'll just say you're worth 19 million. And, you know, and that was another one of those light bulb moments like, oh my God, you could just do that, right? All of a sudden you realize people just say you're worth this, you're worth that. It's also freaking arbitrary. Sure, you can sit with an Excel spreadsheet and do actuarial projections and so forth. But the idea of the value of what it is that you do financially is really at the discretion of the investor or the buyer. It really hit home with me then. Anyway, so that was the B round. We raised money from Opus Capital. Uh, I learned a lot of how to scale a company, and that's where I met now my business partner, this guy named David Willen. And David came in through a corporate headhunter who I was adamantly against headhunters. Sorry, Tom. I know, I know, because I, I was like, I don't know, headhunter. And the VC insisted I use this headhunter. So we did, and I brought in two people, this guy, David Willen, who was the chief technical officer, so did all the, the architecture and engineering design for um, Dun and, he was a lead developer at Dun & Bradstreet. He was the CTO of barnesandnoble.com, the CT, uh, CTO of thestreet.com, the lead engineer at Avon. And David in technology and architect, he just taught me so much in how to scale a company and the cloud had just come up and all of a sudden you need to spend your money and buying all this stuff like racks of servers because you could just rent Amazons. And the other person was a woman named Lisa Brabanti, who we recruited away from a a publicly traded telecom. And she became our chief marketing officer. And she just educated the hell out of me on on how to acquire customers. So it was just absorbing information and learning how to scale a company during this zeitgeist. And we we just took off. And within a three-year period at a certain point, there was over $800 million earned by our clients. The everybody else from downloads and, and streams and who else was was anybody else doing this at this time? So I didn't even know CD Baby existed, okay. right? And I discovered them after we launched TuneCore. So there was CD Baby and props to Derek Sivers because he had created a pick, pack, and ship warehouse solution for stuff that Amazon wouldn't take. Right? It was out of his garage, and he sort of lumped digital on top. But their model was to take nine percent of the sales, a percentage and charge for barcodes and ISRC codes and all this other stuff. 
there was in grooves that came around, there was the orchard, but there wasn't any entity that just said simply come to the website, upload your stuff, pay a flat fee, get all the money, cancel whatever you want, here you go. And it, it just hadn't existed. So some were doing some portions of it, but not, not all of it and not like this. And um, yeah, but building systems to deal with the crazy shit that came in, like 27 places to the right of a decimal point. Right? What do you do with that? You don't want to become um, Richard Pryor in Superman 2 or, or whatever it was where you're rounding your office space where you're taking those fractions of pennies, right? Because that's just wrong. That's stealing other people's money. How do you deal with all this big data? Mapping the information back to the client, creating audit trails to confirm everyone's getting paid properly. And then you have the crazy stuff happening like, uh, here's two, two benchmark crazy things. One is we had this group of like 10 DJs out of the UK that created their own music, but it was primarily loops, beats, and samples. And they came to TuneCore and they distributed their albums into iTunes. Then what they did is they went and they bought their own music in iTunes using stolen credit cards. They had 20,000 stolen credit cards. They bought over a million dollars of their own music in iTunes. iTunes pays TuneCore. TuneCore remits all the payment back to them. They were literally printing their own money. And we kind of, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember Alex Luke. You might. Sure, you know? of course. Okay. So I remember talking about this with Alex, who was at Apple at the time. We were trying to figure out why is this stuff selling? And it was revealed it was selling because of the stolen credit cards. And so now I had to deal with an international sting operation to figure out how to get these DJs to fly to the United States so they can arrest them when they got into US soil. I mean, it was nuts. Or the other fun one was there used to be this latency. latency. So when we started TuneCore, and we could actually mail me a physical CD or you could upload stuff to us. There was still a lot of technology and so forth. But when you delivered your information to Apple, it took about eight weeks for it to go live in the iTunes music service, huge latency. And as you go through time, it got shorter and shorter and shorter until one day it took 36 seconds. When that latency got that short, it had just happened. We go to bed, wake up the next morning and I have uh, Scott Bruschetta ready to rip my head off because somebody in Vietnam took Taylor Swift's new album, put it through the TuneCore system at 3 a.m. in the middle of, you know, in the morning, it went live in the iTunes music service within a minute. You had two versions of the Taylor Swift album up, one from Universal, right through, and the other was this copyright infringing one out of Vietnam. They're selling it for $9.99, they're selling it for $12.99. And that was, a, that was another come to Jesus moment where Apple was like, oh my God, and I'm like, oh my God. And we had to come up with new processes, again, to deal with this copyright infringement and fraud. So it's interesting as I'm sitting here scaling the company and, and trying to get innovative and give the, the clients what they want. It's like water always finds the holes, right? And it goes through it. And now I'm being distracted by fraudsters out of Vietnam and you know DJs out of the UK. And so it's just the crazy stuff that comes with building a company. So having heard all that, that's amazing. And pretty it's crazy. But having heard all that, I can now, I now see the logical progression on how, you know, Audium and then word collections has come out of that and how you know so much about this stuff because it's yeah, yeah, as you explain some of this stuff to me because Audium was not something when I was on the publishing side at a major and I'm more on the a &R side I was not you know I was not on the collection side of things and was not really honestly aware of it I knew Audium by name but didn't know you know no. did, didn't know what they did but having now spent time with you and hearing about that in word collections they'll you know it's it's pretty fascinating so it feels like that was a sort of a lot kind of a logical progression in some way it was it was it, so i i don't know if it's a blind spot or an achilles heel or just who or what i am but i get very frustrated sometimes when i speak to others within the same industry that haven't had the exact same experience now i clearly don't know what they know and haven't had their experiences but when i'm told you know two plus two is five and I'm like, no, I, I, I've done it. I'm, I'm holding it. I, it's, it's not. It's this other thing. And they're like, no, you're wrong. It's like, no, it drives me crazy. And it just comes from this direct hands-on experience. So what happened next with TuneCore, which was the segue into Audium, was one day, again, this is just one of those moments. There's a guy named George Howard, who's a professor at Berkeley. Uh, George I've, also I've seen, I've seen him on this. Uh, yeah, yeah. He did this so before. I saw him on that. So George used to be the president of Ryko Disc and had his own record label, managed Carly Simon, and he's very ahead of his time. And 
I don't know what it was, but one day I was talking to George and I began thinking about mechanical royalties because apparently I have nothing better to do in my life. And I thought, are my clients, my customers at TuneCorp, getting paid their mechanical royalties? And that began the rabbit hole of music publishing, right? I had to learn, well, what does that mean? And how are they generated? And what are the laws? And I couldn't get answers from anybody. I mean, literally, I was talking to... And so I had to figure it out. It was just, it's like Watergate, follow the money. So ultimately what I did is I, I figured out, okay, when is a mechanical royalty generated for the songwriter? And how is that licensed? And then where does it go? And we figured out in the US, there's this thing called a pass-through, right? But outside of the United States, it didn't work like that. So I thought, huh. And we went and we looked at our sound recordings sales because we had that information. We said, all right, outside of the United States, where is the music being sold or streamed? And there was my, my treasure map of, well, where's the money? The second royalty. And what came out of that was uh, the, the music, the songs, okay, not the recordings, but the songs, the compositions had never gotten licensed. Like, where did iTunes get the license to the song that was written by the kid in Boise, Idaho in the United Kingdom? Where did they get it from? Right. You, you couldn't get it from the local collection agency in England called PRS because or MCPS, because the kid in Boise, Idaho, isn't a member of those organizations. Heck, the kid in Boise, Idaho, isn't even a member of ASCAP or BMI, which only represent public performance rights, not reproduction. Rights. So it was like what, and ultimately what was unearthed was all the DSPs, all the digital services, they knew this stuff, but they didn't want to deal with it because it's a pain in the ass. So what they did is they pretended they were licensed when they weren't, and then took the money that would have been generated, these mechanical royalties, and they just handed them over to the local collection agency in those countries, right? It goes to like, here's a pile of money for stuff you don't represent. Those organizations like, right, I'll take the money. They took a percentage of it as their, as their fee, and then they took the rest and they stuck it into something called a black box, which then they paid out to... Warner, Universal, Sony, BMG, Cobalt, et cetera, based on their market share. And all in the meantime, you got this kid in Boise, Idaho, that doesn't even realize he or she has earned this extra money that they never got. And it, it was just like, it, it wasn't like 20 cents. It was $120 million for my clients. And that was just my clients, right? Uh, so that became the next sort of agenda. How do I get this money? How do I help get the friction out of this, provide licensing and build systems to license and collect? And that's kind of where that audium iteration came from. I identified there's this huge hole in the market, man. The music industry isn't built to deal with big data. It's sex, drugs, rock and roll, finding and developing culture and talent, right? With the Warner Music Group, most likely is never going to make a smartphone any more than Apple Music. Apple is going to write the song Hotel California. They're, they're just not the same things. And I need to find a uh, fill the void between the two. So that's kind of where I began to get into it. And the other uh, sort of epiphany was with Spotify. It was 2010, late to 2010, 2011, and Spotify was you know, coming up into the US market and I was entering into a licensing deal with them for TuneCore's recordings. And I remember I was on the phone with the guy in Sweden at the time, I don't remember his name. And I said, listen, when I send you the information for the recordings, right, you have what's required information, and then you have optional information. And I see the optional information is the songwriter and the publisher and the percentage. I have that. I, I'd like to include that. And they said, don't send it. I said, why? Because we have no systems to take it. Don't worry about it. Okay. And so we sent over, you know, over a million sound recordings of probably around, you know, a million unique songs. And it just started getting streamed, right? And there was no information because they wouldn't take it. And the Harry Fox agency, which ultimately worked for Spotify, they didn't know it. How would they know it, right? They're just some random third-party company. And so that stuck with me. And when I, I unceremoniously left TuneCore in 2012, it was not a nice breakup. And I don't mind discussing it. I just don't know if you want me to go down that rabbit hole. This stuck with me and was the concept for Audium, which is songwriters and music publishers aren't being properly licensed and paid for the streams of their recordings in YouTube and Spotify, Apple and Rhapsody, et cetera. That's what I want to do next. And I want to build a company that has the technology and the knowledge to serve that community. And that's where Audium came from. 
Got it. And then how, so the really fascinating thing to me is this comedy space and the spoken word space, yes. this, which has really been white space as far, this the fact, it, you know, I know you've told me this before, but I'd love to talk about that a little bit. Just the, the fact of this years and years and years and years of recordings and everything that is in the, in the comedy and spoken word space that nobody has ever been paid for. Yeah. And, and the people in that world don't really understand this side of the business like maybe the music people do. It, it, you're right. it was the same education process for me. So when I, at TuneCore, Cat Williams uh, was using TuneCore for distribution of his comedy sound recordings, right? And so, hey, look at all this comedy stuff. And then there was all the major labels and their comedy stuff. Then we move over to songwriters and music. And holy crap, it's not that Spotify was licensed and then wasn't paying the royalties. They never got the license in the first place. And that then came the class action lawsuits and then came the writing and blah, 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 and building the systems to figure it out. So TuneCore got purchased by Believe Digital out of France. And then Audium got acquired by SoCan out of Canada. And this is segueing into this, you know, the, the third generation here of company, word collections or fourth with Spinart. And when SoCan acquired Audium, uh, they made a decision a number of years later to sell it. And they wanted to sell it to HFA, CSAC, which I didn't want to be a part of. And I left the company. Um, I told them I'd like to leave. And how would they like me to do that? And ultimately they said, you're terminated, goodbye. Okay. I had a 12 month non-compete where I was not allowed to do music publishing administration. TuneCore, excuse me, so can threaten me. We're gonna sue you if you help songwriters and publishers or whatever. So um, Bob Cohn, the old acquaintance from eMusic and I had maintained a relationship and I was talking to Bob and Bob said, hey, I work for the George Carlin or work with the George Carlin estate and George Carlin isn't getting paid his public performance royalties for his literary works. And I thought, what does that mean? <laughs> it took me a second. And I realized that just because Robin Williams says reality, what a concept, as opposed to Singh's reality, what a concept, doesn't mean he doesn't have a copyright. It's the exact same copyright as music. It's in the same sentence of the regulatory copyright laws around the world. Music, spoken word, same copyright, same rights types, right? There's public performance, reproduction, distribution, digital transmission, uh, derivatives, and public display. Right? Same rights types, same copyright, and it's being used by the same places in the same way. The difference is music has some regulatory infrastructure and at least some pipelines for licensing and collection. It's flawed or as inefficient they might be, there's still something there. For spoken word, wait a second, there's nothing. Let's go back to George Carlin, seven words you can't say on television and compare that to Whitney Houston singing, I will always love you, All right? So, Sirius XM, Pandora, digital radio, let's stick with digital radio. They go and they, they broadcast, they play, I Will Always Love You as recorded by Whitney Houston for Arista Records. It's digital radio. Well, there's a payment made to Arista Records and to Whitney Houston for the recording because it's digital radio in the United States. AM, FM radio, you don't get that, digital you do. And then Dolly Parton wrote the lyric and the melody, right? And Sirius XM, Pandora get a license for Dolly Parton through a performing rights organization, a PRO, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. Oh, she, she, she should get in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for that, don't you think? I do. In, <laughs> in and of itself, that <laughs> is the just, throw, just saying, just saying. Anyway, go ahead. So they got the record labels getting paid and then Dolly Parton's getting paid, but Dolly Parton's going from the, uh, the radio station to the PRO to Dolly Parton, right? Because... Sirius XM Pandora enter into a blanket license with the PRO. Hey, I would like to get a license to everyone and all the songs you represent. Okay, what happens if you're George Carlin? You're not music. You're not a member of ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, or GMR. Now, Sirius XM, <clears throat> Pandora have a comedy station. 2011, Pandora made a public announcement. We're going to do an IPO. We're going to try to raise $100 million. And before we do that, we're launching this whole comedy initiative because we think that will bolster listenership. It'll be better for the company. And we're going to use these recordings of comedians to broadcast and pay, you know, get licenses and make payments. 
because it'll benefit our company. We'll make $100 million on the IPO. And then we're going to sell our company eventually to SiriusXM for over $2 billion. Totally fine with all that. The problem is, where did they get the license for George Carlin from? Okay, for the recording, 1972, Class Clown, Atlantic Records, George Carlin records that album. Atlantic controls the recording, right? Pandora, SiriusXM are paying the money to an organization called Sound Exchange or the direct licensing, but the record label and George Carlin as the performer are getting paid. But over here, here, whoop, here we go. Here's Dolly Parton. Okay, now replace Dolly Parton with George Carlin. George Carlin's not a member of CSEC, BMI, CSEC, GMR. Where did they get the public performance license from? They didn't. That's copyright infringement, right? And Pandora in particular was aware of this because in their own Security and Exchange Commission's filings, they're called 10K filings, which discuss risk for people that want to buy their stock. They literally put in a section about between 2011 and 2018, every single year in these filings, they said, we have risk because we're broadcasting spoken word comedy, but we haven't secured the literary work license for public performance. So when you speak something as opposed to sing it, it's called the literary work. When you sing it, it's a musical composition, just the terminology. So they were aware of it, right? They knew they didn't have the freaking license. They knew they wanted to make $100 million and then sell themselves for $2 billion. Eh, screw it. We'll just infringe on the copyright. We won't deal with the fact that we need to get that license. We won't be making any payments. And the end result is it's not just Pandora. Right, it's it's Spotify, it's Apple Music, it's Amazon, it's YouTube, it's everything, it's global. Right, over the last eight years, anytime there's been a broadcast or an interactive stream or a YouTube stream, or whatever, where did these entities get the license for that second copyright, the underlying literary work for the right to use it? In most cases, they just didn't. And there's over one trillion. That's what the T streams broadcast in the last just wow. eight years, which would have generated over one billion dollars in royalties if you use the music royalties as a uh, as a term, that never got paid. So there's this huge pile of money that's never been paid, and in some cases the streaming services are saying, "Hey, that's the responsibility of the record label," and the record label saying, "No, that's the responsibility of the streaming service." And between the two, it's just huge piles of money. So when Bob Cohn approached me, I'm like, yeah, let me help you with that because I have a non-compete for the next 12 months. But I knew that the systems that I needed to build and the people that I would work with and the people using it, it was all the same as music. So this allowed me to build a company, which after a year, I thought, you know what? We now can also do music. So now we simultaneously represent the Richard Pryor estate and the Robin Williams estate, the George Carlin estate and Margaret Cho and Louis Anderson and Jim Brewer and Ron White and Bill Engvall and Bill Hicks. Keep going down the list. We're the only entity on the planet where these services can come to get a license to use their literary works, right? And we also simultaneously represent Metallica Creeping Death for their music catalog and Jason Mraz and the Songwriters Guild of America and St. Nicholas, which is Holly Jolly Christmas and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and John Cleary and lots of other songs. So it's, it's basically global copyright administration all in one spot. I'm not a publishing administrator. I work for them and I'm a global copyright administration company. It's like pan-European licensing, only it's pan-global licensing. Spotify, et cetera, if you want to use the stuff, it's great. We'll issue you a license, you pay us back directly. And the end result of that is 40% more money on the music side, 12 months faster for digital and for the spoken word. It's, they've never been paid before, right? There's been resistance to paying the spoken word people because the money's got to come from somewhere. The end result is six of, of the clients that I work for, members of Word Collection, have sued Pandora for willful copyright infringement. Uh, Richard Bush being the litigator, and those law complaints were filed about six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, and um, that's working its way through the legal system. So this is now is no longer a matter of if spoken word comedians or poets or Muhammad Ali are going to be paid. It's a matter of when, but we just have to go through this ridiculous process again where they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar, and now it's a cost-benefit analysis and wrestling it down to make the damages and the parking ticket as low as possible for the exploitation of that license. Wow. Yeah. So okay. exhaust, this is exhausting to have to, what you have to do. I like it's, it, 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 this, this no, it's incredible. Listen, I've, we've talked about this a bit before and I'm just, I find it fascinating, especially having, you know, been on the publishing side and not necessarily been aware of, 
the, the deep, deep, deep weeds you're in. Oh, it's crazy. Stuff. It, it, well, this I, is my song, I, right? This, yeah. is, this is, I don't have the musical talent. This is my song. But what drives me crazy is, you know, I'm aware of the reputation I have out in the industry. And, and some of it, in my opinion, is unfounded, but it is what it is. You know, my philosophy is real simple. If you want to use someone's stuff, it's totally fine. Just get their permission. It's a license. Pay a commensurate royalty. And the entity that earned the money should get paid the money. That's my radical position. And I get very, very frustrated with the concept of failure is okay. Screw it. We don't have to figure out who we have to pay. We'll just have big sloshes of black box money that we'll just allocate out randomly. We can do better than that. Come on. Are we really, really, that's acceptable that we can't build systems to make sure Sony gets paid for Sony stuff, Universal gets paid for Universal stuff, and the kid in the bedroom in Boise, Idaho gets paid for his stuff. We really can't fix this problem. We're turning a, uh, uh, making a business model out of inefficiency and saying, screw it, we'll just take people's money and hand it to those that didn't earn it. Come on, we can do better than that. And, and that, that's where I get very frustrated and indignant. It's like, I, I can't believe I have to have this fight Shouldn't we just pay the people their money? Well, I, I, I love your passion and your, uh, no, it, it's, it's true. It's because uh, it's complicated and it's tough, but. Um, it, I mean, thank, it's, thanks it's, for letting it's me. It's eye long. What's that? And so thank you for letting me ramble on about it for so long. And, <laughs> you know, honestly, it's, it's, it's very therapeutic <laughs> to some degree. That's, you know, I'll send you a bill. I'll send, <laughs> I'll send you a bill for it all. I want the jet med thing again. <laughs> Tom, how how are we doing here, Tom? <laughs> how are we doing on time? I'm sorry, I had to unmute myself. Uh, from the chatter in the um, chat room, they want a second session because there's so much more to unpeel here. <laughs> we are over time for today and out of respect for everyone's time, none the least of which is yours, Rick and Jeff, I would like to hit the pause button today and get a commitment from you guys to come back for part two at some point in the near future. There's plenty of people that say I should be committed. So I'm in. <laughs> no, I mean, Jeff, you've proven my point here today. You are the smartest guy in the room. And oh, please. I, I, appreciate I, I won't argue with that. <laughs> well, and you, you have been a, a very disruptive force in the music industry. And I would suggest for the better, there's some people out there that would debate me on that, but the fact is you have been tirelessly working for copyright owners to be properly paid for a long time. And I thank you for that. Um, hats off to you, man. Um, I mean, hey, well, you know, well, I wouldn't have a career if not for people with, with musical or creative talent. So I'm grateful that they give me the opportunity to work for them, to be perfectly blunt. Me too, well, in a totally different way. I wanted, to, I wanted to be in a band, but when my band, the best gig we ever got was an opening act at a frat party. I figured that's probably not going to happen for me as a career. So uh, I got out early. Well, we appreciate what you're doing. I encourage you to keep doing it. Rick, you too. You're, you're investing in a lot of exciting companies, and I hope some of them pay off big time for you because that means success for them. Um, so with that, folks, I will be announcing Rick and Jeff part two at some point in the future. Um, and just let me say my customary sign off. That is, thanks you for your time. We'll be back here next Thursday at the same time, featuring a couple other rock stars. Meanwhile, be nice to each other. Get a shot if you haven't gotten one and go heels. Thank you. Uh, see you, Jeff. Thank you very much. <laughs>